this section of the paper, State and Civil Society um, Relations, is going to focus on the struggle to remove the petroleum subsidy. So I am struck by the ways in which Nigerian history is pretty much repeating itself. And where it seems as if we have not actually learned the lessons of history. So on the struggle to remove the petroleum subsidy, which is roughly part of page eight to page 11 or 12 in this paper, the IMF conditionality was that the petroleum subsidy should be removed either in one single step, remember this was the 1980s, right? Or over a three year period. As with the other conditionalities, the Babangida regime was more thoroughgoing than its predecessors in, in its attempt to eliminate the subsidy on petrol. Babangida's regime maintained that the removal would balance the budget, that it would encourage efficient utilization of a wasting resource and curtail the smuggling and bunkering of petroleum products. It was also said that the funds released by the removal would be used to develop a mass transit system, create jobs, and improve its fiscal balance. In his 1986 budget speech, the president announced an increase in the price of petroleum products. So Nigerians, I hope this is giving you a historical context to this matter. While the implementation of SAP policies encountered a general resistance. The reduction of the petroleum subsidy was the most explosive. As a result, one of the broadest coalitions of interclass, sectional, and group alliances known in modern Nigerian politics was forged. This coalition persistently arrayed itself against the government over these and ensuing issues. The confrontations were vociferous, bloody, and unrelenting. Hence, it serves to illustrate the degree to which the public took an uncompromising stance vis-a-vis -vis government policy. And today we are still having issues in Nigeria over the petroleum subsidy. The Nigerian Labor Congress, NLC, objected to the reduction of the subsidy, which it criticized as feeding an inflationary spiral and contributing to the immiseration of workers by reducing their purchasing power and increasing the level of hardship that they experienced with transportation. Workers therefore demanded an upward review of wages in line with inflation if the government was hell bent on subsidy removal. Another secondary perspective was one which categorically rejected an IMF loan and petroleum subsidy for regional reasons. For some, the removal of petroleum subsidies was unacceptable because it would make petroleum products more expensive and drive up all prices, particularly in the North of Nigeria. In contrast, Nasima took the position that low petroleum prices were not justifiable 
given Nigeria's predicament. The association suggested that in order to combat smuggling and augment government revenue, a phasing out of the subsidies should take place over a period of approximately two years, with subsidies maintained on fuel used by commercial vehicles and for household consumption. It felt that prices should be reviewed regularly to reflect changing market prices. As indicated earlier, MAN or the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria recommended a selective removal of the petroleum subsidy because of its potential to exacerbate inflation. In his budget speech, President Babangida noted that the devaluation of the Naira had made the price of petroleum products cheaper, leading to increased smuggling to other West African states. He warned that if surveillance and preventive measures did not work, his administration, quote, would not hesitate to introduce the necessary corrective through price adjustment, unquote. Later that year, following further decline in the value of the Naira, an attempt was made to reduce the petroleum subsidy. In November and December, the regime sponsored a media campaign to promote an increase in the price of petroleum products. The move met with widespread opposition from the Nigerian public. The NLC, the Academic Staff Union of Nigerian Universities or ASU, and the National Association of Nigerian Students, NANS, jointly opposed the government's plan to phase out the subsidy by successfully presenting convincing reasons why the subsidy should not be eliminated. The NLC in particular embarked on its own media crusade to argue against subsidy removal. And it organized demonstrations in protest. The Inspector General of Police announced in a broadcast to the nation that all demonstrations, strikes, and public processions were banned forthwith. Among those arrested in connection with these demonstrations were journalists, university lecturers, students, student union leaders, and militants. They were detained and the state threatened to bring charges of sedition against them for an unreasonable and selfish desire to foment crisis and public discontent against the government. These detainees were later released because the overwhelming force of public opinion was in their favor. <laughs> Consequently, the 1988 budget made no mention of increases in the price of petroleum products. Workers celebrated their victory openly. The Babangida regime decided to pave the way for a future problem-free increase by taking three steps. First, it announced that petroleum products, quote, would continue to attract a reasonable level of government subsidy. Second, it allocated 700 million Naira, or at the time, 168.7 million Naira to be spent on improving public transportation. I wonder what happened, because public transportation is still in an atrocious state in Nigeria. And that part of the money 
would be spent on buying locally assembled vehicles in order to provide employment. A task force on mass transportation was also established under the office of the chief of general staff to speed up the implementation of the program. Thirdly, in February 1988, under the pretext of uniting the moderate and radical factions of the NLC, the regime suspended the union leaders and appointed a sole administrator to handle its affairs. The regime then attempted to deflect the expected negative reactions to increases by delegating the responsibility for announcing the increase in petroleum prices, that is, or petrol prices, to the national, to the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation or NNPC, which announced a modest increase in the prices of petroleum products on April 10, 1988. This announcement led to widespread demonstrations by students, bank employees, air traffic controllers, hospital workers, tanker drivers, teachers and traders, and this paralyzed the nation. Students were penalized for their role when 31 educational institutions were ordered to be closed by the Babangida uh, regime. Some of them remained closed until 1990. Student unions were also banned. Their leaders were detained and arraigned before the miscellaneous decree tribunal, which had the power by decree to pass sentences of up to 21 years. This generated more protests and boycotts of lectures by students. The government also attempted to infiltrate the student movement and supplant NANS, the, the organization of Nigerian students with its own organization, but it was unsuccessful in doing this. Although the NLC was proscribed, Workers were able to organize nationwide strikes through their local action committees. And an attempt was made by the labor movement to persuade the lower levels of the armed forces to join the protests. The leaders of the action committees were arrested and the regime conducted a program of intimidation against workers. Many were threatened with dismissal and imprisonment for sabotaging state policy. The regime also maintained that the workers' actions constituted a selfish outburst of an urban elite, which was not supported by the rural majority. The continuation of strikes and popular unrest, however, eventually forced the government to negotiate with workers. A memorandum of agreement was signed jointly by the federal government and trade unions on October 4, 1988, in which the union leadership agreed to call off the strikes in return for concessions on SAP, as well as on space for student and trade union activism from the government. Finally, the reduction of the petroleum subsidy was scrapped by the regime for the time being. See how history repeats? The matter of the petroleum subsidy was however far from settled, we can say that again. But at the time, which was in the 1980s, a plethora of student protests broke, broke out again, beginning on May 24, 
1989, when students organized demonstrations against various SAP policies, including the removal of the petroleum subsidy. After, this was after the expiration of a six week ultimatum that was issued by NANS, the student's movement, to the government in November, 1988. There were also bloody confrontations between the police and protesting students. So NSAS protesters take note. Uh, the attack on protesters is not new. You also had uh, the Armed Forces Ruling Council um, having their policies challenged on various fronts. The NANS ultimatum had been accompanied by a 10 point demand for the amelioration of what the students termed, quote, the pains of SAP, unquote. NANS reiterated these demands when it issued a 24 hour ultimatum after considerable loss of lives as the military had been ordered to shoot demonstrators on site. Does this sound familiar? We had that happen three years ago. <laughs> As with the earlier ultimatum, this was ignored. The protests became even bloodier and educational institutions at all levels were closed down throughout the country. The government ridiculed students for being mere tools in the hands of what it called unscrupulous Nigerians who felt the transition to civil rule could not go on without them, unquote. The selective reopening of the universities on July 3, 1989, led to boycott of classes by university students, student nurses, secondary and primary school pupils. At the Lagos High Court, as undergraduate, an undergraduate student at the University of Lagos, his name, Olushola Dairu, brought a lawsuit against the government based on the argument that SAP was a violation of students' fundamental human rights. The selective closure policy was reversed. Although NANS leaders were arrested and detained under decree number two. The evidence of the existence of a trans-class coalition emerges when one considers that support for the students came from diverse sources. This included other organizations, such as the Committee for the Defense of Human Rights, the Civil Liberty Organization, the NLC, the Nigerian Political Science Association, the Christian Association of Nigeria, the Ondo State Congress of Farmers, the Nigerian Bar Association, groups of university lecturers, traders, and respondents to public opinion surveys. Many social critics, including Wale Shoyinka and Tai Sholani, who is of blessed memory, and many other individuals also spoke out in support of the students. This coalition was, however, unable to mobilize and execute consistent opposition to government policies in the face of the regime's open repression. Eventually, the government of General Babangida, who at the time had changed into Agbada and was calling himself president, increased petrol prices in 1989 through a two-tier price structure which enabled commercial motorists to pay less and later introduced a voucher system through which commercial vehicles were given discounts. 
In addition, a number of quote unquote SAP relief measures were announced to smooth the way for the removal of the subsidy. <laughs> this should remind you of the palliatives of today's um, government. The student union activities, control and regulation decree number 47 was promulgated in 1989. It made national student unions illegal and the unions in individual universities were subjected, were to be subject to proscription if found to act contrary to national interest, security, public safety, morality, and health. Violators of the decree were subject to prosecution by the Special Miscellaneous Off Offenses Tribunal, and they could be imprisoned for a five-year term and fined 500,000 Naira. At that time, that was a fortune um, if they were found guilty. Due to the difficulties in obtaining its fifth standby arrangement with the IMF, which insisted on the complete removal of petroleum subsidies, a further increase in the prices of petroleum products was sought by the regime in late 1992. Knowing from experience that this would be an explosive issue, it engaged in another media blitz and widespread campaigns. This required NNPC officials to travel extensively within the country and outside to Nigerian communities abroad to present the correct pricing of petroleum as the rationale for the proposed price increases. The low price of petroleum products was identified as the main cause of the proliferation of smuggling and bunkering and the government's loss of substantial revenue. Most Nigerians, however, continued to reject the proposed in increase. Babangida made one last ditch attempt to remove the subsidy on petroleum by passing a decree increasing prices on virtually his final day of office, leaving the responsibility of implementation to the interim national government that he had foisted on the people. There's a whole story behind this. You'll have to read my book, Isapt Democracy, to get the full story. The seven-fold price increase only served to intensify tensions already kindled by the subversion of the June 12 presidential elections by the Babangida regime. Again, a big story. And it is um, talked about in that book, A Sapped Democracy. Nationwide strikes were organized to protest both the um, election cancellation and the price increases leading to economic paralysis throughout Nigeria. This contributed in no small measure to the fall of the interim government as the Abacha led mil military used the crisis as an opportunity to insert itself as the new solution. A compromise which involved some reduction of the new price was finally reached after lengthy negotiations between the government and several unions. So this is part three of the paper. And it tells us that what we are observing today has a history to it. And those who forget the lessons of history are bound to repeat it and they're bound to suffer the consequences. Thank you very much.